What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome back to the channel for the final team outlook. Oh man, I am happy to be done with this playlist of videos or this this column of videos. I guess I don't know what you call a column in video form, but I'm I'm pumped up to be done. I'm shooting these vid like this video. I'm probably shooting a week and a half before it's released anyway, so shit might change. I didn't read the Roto World blurbs yet last night or this morning, so I kind of wanted, I'm going to do this a little differently and just run through the, the blurbs that came out this morning and kind of give you my thoughts on it, almost like a recap of last night. So we have Jamal Williams and Ty Montgomery in Green Bay. For the second straight day, ESPN Packers reporter Rob Domofsky reported fourth round running back Jamal Williams appears to be pushing Ty Montgomery for starting duties. Yeah, I'll believe it when I see it. After uh, Mike McCarthy came out and said Ty Montgomery is the full threat ready to go it's possible Jamal Williams takes over some third down work but in my opinion Ty Montgomery is definitely that guy I don't think he's losing that backfield anytime soon the one play he does need to improve on his pass production which is where Jamal Williams is kind of getting praise from but Ty Montgomery bulked up a little bit he's he's actually the biggest running back to have on the roster now so I think he'll be able to handle that load without a problem next up Eddie Lacy the Seahawks haven't revealed if Eddie Lacy hit his target at his latest way in and his agent won't say anything either. That's incredible because if you followed me on this channel at all, I might be wrong on everything I've ever said, but every year I know that Eddie Lacy will still be fat and that will ruin him. And I've been saying it all off season already. I said it all off season last year. He didn't hit his fucking way in and you fucking know it because if he did, they would be coming out and saying he hit his way in. Why would they be hiding it? I'm pumped up about that. Eddie Lacy's going down this year, man. Thomas Rawls. It's Rawls Royce season, baby. Zeke Elliott had a late June hearing with Commissioner Roger Goodell. All right, look, I don't care. Just make a goddamn decision already. Carlos Hyde has been pancaking would-be tacklers in training camp. Also been on the Hyde bandwagon. I don't think anyone is coming to take his spot. Said that plenty of times. He's supposed to be the starter there, and he will be the starter. Reports the Dolphins now fear Ryan Tannehill will require season-ending surgery, but have yet to make a final decision. He's probably got to get like 17 more tests done. If he doesn't get surgery, he can rest for six to eight weeks and see what happens. As it stands right now, if he's out, Matt Moore would be their backup. He would step in as starter. I see a lot of fantasy reporters, if you experts, if you follow them on Twitter, they're all like, oh, Matt Moore is pretty good. You know, he's a solid backup. And I was looking at it and I'm like, I guess, but at the same time, he hasn't he hasn't had a workload since 2011. Like, how are you just okay with that? I don't know. I would say if it's going to be interesting because they could go, they could stick with Matt Moore. And then you got to think about it. Jay Cutler is out there. Him and Adam Gase played together. Obviously, Connor Kaepernick. I read somewhere that JHI and the Dolphins played their best when they were running the uh, the read option with the running back and quarterback, which would be interesting with Colin Kaepernick because he knows how to run that. So the quarterback position is going to be interesting in Miami. I think if, I really think if anyone takes over, if it's not Ryan Tannehill, I think the big hits are to Stills and to um, Devonta Parker. Jarvis Landry obviously runs his routes over the middle. The shorter routes, it's not hard for any quarterback to make those throws. J.J. is gonna see the same amount of volume, if not more, with another quarterback. And it's not like Tannehill was Aaron Rodgers, you know, taking away everyone out of the box. So he's, if, if they were gonna be blitzing on J.J., if they were putting eight in the box, they're not, not doing it anymore because Ryan Tannehill's not there. So I'm not going to speculate on who's going to be the quarterback, but it should be interesting. Uh, they had the Hall of Fame game last night. Alfred Morris looked good. That's fantastic. TJ Logan injured his wrist. Eh, that sucks. He was a nice little playmaker behind David Johnson. Derrick Henry, ESPN Titans reporter Cameron Wolf believes it's not unrealistic that Darren Henry could come close to doubling his total yards from 2016 to 2017. Uh, considering he had 640 total yards, yes, that's out of control because DeMarco Murray is there. He's not going to have 1,300 total yards unless Murray's out for the season. I know... Murray actually did something with his hamstring yesterday, but also not speculating on that. It's nothing, you don't want to see that with a running back, of course, but thank you, Ignacio Garcia. You're a good man. I just saw your comment. Hey, Nick, I'll be pursuing your guy no matter what, because in my opinion, I think you are the best fantasy football advisor. I can't see past that on my screen, but thank you, man. I appreciate that. No, DeMarco Murray's that guy. Derrick Henry, again, is being overvalued as the RB2 there. You're, you're drafting him as a handcuff, and he's an expensive-ass handcuff, so... You know, if you think Murray's going to be hurt, then sure, draft. But, like, I, I don't know what your basis on that is. Dalvin Cook, Vikings OC, Pat Shermer saying second-round rookie Dalvin Cook's praises for his ability and pass protection. Beautiful. Because, like I said, I love Dalvin Cook this year. Praises his ability and pass protection. That's great because he was already a superior runner to Latavius Murray and Jarek McKinnon. And now, if he can lock down the third-down role, he will be their featured back there, as I predicted. And as a rookie, obviously, that's your biggest concern, right? Can he pass protect at the next level? And if they're praising him, 
him for it. Yes, he could obviously do it, meaning he could play on all three downs. Latavius Murray hasn't even been back to practice yet. Get Dalvin Cook while you can, people, I'm telling you. Rex Burkhead, uh, Mike Garrardi reports the Patriots haven't been shy about getting Rex Burkhead reps in short yards and goal line situations. What I've been saying, people, in my Patriots outcast, I said, relax on Gillisley. Stop taking him in the fourth and fifth round because they have four backs that can work on all three downs. Gillisley was like 20 to 30 pounds lighter than Garrett Blunt is. I don't know if they give him all the goal line work that he saw. Burkhead is going to be used in that goal line area, whether it's as like a Danny Woodhead type guy or if they let him plunge in there from the one yard line. I'm just saying buyer beware and Gillisley. I don't think the double digit upside touchdown is out of reach at, at any means, but it is the Patriots running back. I wouldn't just assume he's gonna be a high end RB2 for you. ESPN Bengals reporter Catherine Terrell expects Jeremy Hill to enter the season as the starting running back. Yeah, and then we woke up. Uh, very possible just because Joe Mixon's a rookie, he's a starting running back. By week two or three, that will not be the case anymore. Mixon's by far the most talented guy there and we'll be seeing 15 to 20 touches by the time a couple weeks into the season comes. So don't worry about Jeremy Hill. Adam Gase offered no update on Ryan Tannehill. Dante Moncrief suffered a sprained AC joint in his shoulder on Thursday. Fuck. That messed up this is this whole outlook I just had for you because I'm doing the Colts outlook right now. Day to day, he missed a ton of action last season with a shoulder issue, though that was a sh broken shoulder blade. Sprained AC joint. That's happened to a few people over the last few, few years. I can't remember who. Was it Jeremy Macklin? I think it was Jordan Reed too. So we've seen that that injury affect people pretty pretty heavily. So if that's the case, he needs to come back to full health. I was already way off the Moncrief bandwagon, but this could be big news for Chesser. BJ Kissel of the Chiefs official website reports the Alex Smith Tariq Hill connection has been great during camp. Love that. If you guys didn't watch my video, I did a specific video on Tyreek Hill's outlook. I will link it right here. Go watch that. Big fan of that guy this year. And that is the last of the Roto blurb. If you want to read these blurbs, I really highly suggest it's probably the number one like source of news that you should be getting for your fantasy football. Just rotoworld.com. On the top, you'll see like all like NFL, MLB, go NFL player news. And it has like every blurb from every beat reporter, every team. Sorry for making this intro very long, but well, I was actually thinking about doing that during the, the regular season, going through the blurbs and kind of giving my thoughts as I see them. Let me know if that was like, if you liked that part of the video or if you're like, shit, that took way too long and I already clicked off the video at which point you wouldn't be seeing this. But um, let me know if you like this part, me going through and giving my opinions on these blurred. I know it took a while, but let's get into the Indianapolis Colts outlook now. I just realized this entire time that it's not the Indianapolis Colts outline, it's the Tennessee Titans. That's fantastic. I already did the Colts, that already dropped. Jesus Christ, I'm the worst. Flip, do a little, back it up, 180, Tennessee Titans coming at you. Wow, I apologize, I'm an idiot. Okay, Tennessee. So Marcus Mariota, we're getting a lot of love this off season. And I think it's for good reason. So he broke his leg in week 16, fully ready to go, practicing without restrictions. And his team was concerned about his running. They asked him to bulk up. In turn, he cuts weight. He's at 215. He says it makes him feel a lot better. We'll see if he'll be able to withstand the health concerns now. He should be able to move around the pocket a lot more. He dropped like five to 10 pounds. So he's at 215. Last year, he was playing around 220 to 225. I'm a fan of people dropping weight. I think anytime you drop weight as an NFL player, unless you're too skinny already, it makes you a lot more agile and it just, you move around a lot better, you play a lot better, but we'll see how that works at the quarterback position. And if it works out for Mariota, that builds on his already high rushing upside as a quarterback. When you look back at last year, he ranked sixth among quarterbacks in rushing yards and ninth in 2015, and he only played 12 games in 2015. So he, he's gonna be a top five rusher regardless. But the thing that makes me so excited about, uh, dude, I'm really high on this Titans team. I actually placed 100 bet on Super Bowl odds for them to win. I think they were like plus 4,000 or some shit like that. So you're getting a big return. Look at what they did on this. They might they might have the best offense in the NFL. You look at their wide receiver group. They drafted Corey Davis fifth overall, right? So now you have Corey Davis, super underrated Rashard Matthews, Eric Decker as their wide receivers. You have Delaney Walker as the tight end, and then you have DeMarco Murray and Derrick Henry in the backfield. Not to mention their offensive line. This is a very underrated part of the Titans. A lot of people don't know this. They have one of probably the top three offensive lines in the NFL. They're ranked fourth, according to Pro Football Focus going into the year, but I think they might be first or second by the end of the year. When you look at Mariota, you look at his success that he's had in the red zone. Over the two years that he's been in the league, 
33 to zero touchdown to interception ratio in the red zone. Best in the business, baby. Eric Decker has been one of the best red zone targets over basically the last five years, so over his career. And now you match him with one of the best red zone quarterbacks. It's like lamb and tuna fish. There's really not much to dislike about Mariota this year. You look back at last year from weeks five to 15, he was quarterback four in fantasy behind only Rodgers, Tom Brady, Drew Brees. And he's going in that middle round of quarterbacks you know, like QB7 to QB12 or 13, where they're all kind of going in the same like span and they all kind of give off around the same value. Um, right now he's 96th, 96th, eighth overall, but that's like four or five picks in front of Cam. Then you have like a run of quarterbacks like Cam, Kirk, and a few other guys going in the same area. So while I'm probably not reaching up for Mariota, if he's, I, I would prefer him to a lot of the guys that are going around in the same spots as him. And again, all credit to Evan Silva, the God. So we have, they have head coach Mike Malarkey there in Tennessee. And when you look at, he was in Atlanta, 2008, 2011, so for a few years. See what he did in Matt Ryan's third year in Atlanta when he leaped from 29 and a half attempts per game as a passer. And Michael Turner was the foundation of that offense. In that third year, they leaped to 35.7 pass attempts per game. And that was a breakout campaign for Matt Ryan. So it's the third year for Marcus Mariota. They had their centerpiece around the running back. And it's very possible that with Mike Malarkey, he kind of has the same template, right? And now he's in, in envisioning Marcus Mariota taping, taking a big leap in terms of pass attempts per game. And then in June, Kevin Cole of Predictive Football showed that Eric Decker's presence has spiked the touchdown rates, touchdowns per pass attempts of every NFL quarterback that he's ever played with. It's a little more upside for Mariota. And before we get into weapons, I wanna throw a few numbers out there just in terms of the offense, in terms of how Tennessee runs things. So in, in 2016, they had the fifth lowest number of pass attempts per game, 31.5. I just kind of talked about that with Mike Malarkey and how I think that's gonna go up. They also ran the third fewest plays out of the three wide receiver set. So only 42% of their plays came with three wide receivers on the field. They ran a ton of two tight end splits, which makes sense because they had a good running back in the backfield and they had two good tight ends, a Delaney Walker and Antti Fasano. Antti Fasano is out of Tennessee. And if you guys are unaware, he's one of the better, if not, you know, one of the top blocking tight ends. So that's probably a big reason why they ran two tight ends set so much. Now he's gone. And they have three wide receivers that they would definitely like to use with Corey Davis, Rashard Matthews, and Eric Decker. So you would see that as a big swing and a big uptick for Mariota's passing volume. When we get into the weapons, this is kind of when things get fun. Because they took Corey Davis out of Western Michigan uh, with the fifth overall pick. I, I think he's he's the best wide receiver in this class all, all around as just a, a really good receiver, the true number one potential. Great possession receiver, he's just 22 years old. 6'3", 210, four, five speed, so a really good combination of side and speed on the outside. Davis graduated as the NCAA's all-time leader in receiving yards, 5,278. He had 331 career receptions with a 16 yards per reception average. Scored 52 touchdowns, and he was the MAC Offensive Player of the Year in 2016. So just really, 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 really good production in college paired with good size and measurables. He is the first wide receiver in fantasy drafts going off the board right now. 88th overall is wide receiver 38. Port did come out yesterday that he hurt his hamstring. He's getting an MRI, and it said he's going to miss time. He pulled up in Thursday's practice before walking gingerly off the field with the trainers. Coach Mike Malarkey said he was not sure about the severity of the in injury, but the MRI raise some concerns. If he's forced to miss times, rookie Taewon Taylor would likely see more snaps with the first team offense. Not good uh, for a rookie, of course. And I was going to say anyways, Davis shouldn't be the first one off the board as Tennessee's uh, fantasy wide receivers as far as they go. One, because I'm not sold on Rashard Matthews being taken out of the picture. I'm not sold on him playing second fiddle to Corey Davis. Not in 2017, at least, maybe in the future. It's hard to overstate how good Rashard Matthews really was in 2016. And it's not like this came out of nowhere. He was good in Miami. He just never got the opportunities to really showcase his talents there. He had six games in Miami total that he received at least six targets. So six games where he got six targets. In every single one of those games, all six, he had at least 85 receiving yards and or a touchdown in six of six. Gave him the opportunity. He balled out. Last season, Matthews finished as wide receiver 11 in standard leagues. So legit wide receiver one in 12 team leagues. And then listen to this, what he did last year. From week five, through when he really started taking over, through the end of the season, that's 12 games. 
Matthews had at least 105 receiving yards and or a touchdown in 10 of those 12 games. You wanna talk about consistency? Matthews saw six targets inside the 10 yard line in 2016, turned all six of those into touchdowns. So not only is he racking up the yards when he gets the targets, but he's a great red zone threat too. It's gonna to be tricky to see how this plays out with, with the Corey Davis injury depending on how much time he misses, depending on how far he falls back, Rashard Matthews should be an every down player in two wide receiver sets. And his value is gonna be so good. He's gonna be so undervalued. He's going like 45 picks after Corey Davis right now. 131 overall wide receiver, 50. I absolutely love that. Now, what I think is if, you know, Corey Davis comes back and earns an outside role, Decker, in three wide receiver sets, Decker will move to the slot. Uh, Rashard Matthews should play on the outside with Davis. And then two, in two wide receiver sets, Decker and Matthews will probably split time. But I think all, all wide receivers will kind of be moving around and splitting time on the outside. But if Davis misses at any time, then Rashard Matthews is an excellent value where he's going. Because Davis has been running with the first team in camp as, as like the X receiver. Matthews has been running as the Z receiver, so the second wide receiver. But I, I really think that's only until Decker gets acclimated and he's been working a lot in the slot, right? He's coming off this hip injury, cost him like 13 games. He's a little older. It's been a big question mark for fantasy owners. I did an entire video about this and what I think is going to happen. This was like a month ago, so a few things have changed, but Decker's also going after Corey Davis at pick 93 wide receiver 40. He should, in my opinion, be the first Tennessee Titans wide receiver off the board. No question in my mind. You look at the five years prior to last year, he missed just two of a possible 80 games. Like I said, he's going to be the slot guy until he acclimates himself, and then not only is he going to be playing in three wide receiver sets, he should get a lot of time in two wide receiver sets. He might split with Rashard Matthews, but he's still going to get a good percentage of snaps there. It was pretty much the same role he played with the Jets too, moving inside and outside, which is great for Decker because he can play both. He, he has the size, the speed, the hands, the play slot or outside. This is all upside for Mariota, all these weapons and all this, this good shit that I'm spewing out about these weapons. Decker and Mariota are just great in the red zone together. If you don't believe me, I got a bunch of stats on Decker. So over the last five seasons, Decker, this is over the last five seasons total, including last year where Decker like barely played. Decker has the second most red zone touchdowns with 36 among all players. And when they run three wide receiver sets, he's going to be in the slot. In Decker's last full season, which was 2015, he ran 68% of his routes from the slot. So he's very comfortable there, of course. He caught the fifth most receptions, 56 and scored the third most receptions from the slot with seven in 2015. I think he's a great bet to lead the team in not only receptions, but touchdowns. And Decker, I think Decker and Matthews are both very undervalued. And I don't, I don't hate Corey Davis at all. I just think there's no reason to have him valued so much higher than the other when they should all get their turn to eat. And then behind these three, as I previously mentioned from that Roto World blurb, you have the third round rookie from Western Kentucky, Taewon Taylor. He's been shining this off season, right? Nothing but praise from OTA. Uh, quotes like, Taylor's always making plays and he looked like the perfect fit at slot. Of course, he's gonna shine in shorts. He was an 81st percentile spark guy. So anyone that's like really athletic is gonna look really good throughout camp. He went to Western Kentucky, so you're like, ah, it's the competition, okay, but when you look at the games that he played against, really good competition, he played some, some powerhouses in the SEC. Well, he played Alabama. He also played Vanderbilt, it was in the SEC. So SEC defense is top of the line. He went nine for 121 against Alabama, nine for 112 against Vanderbilt. So there's no, there's no doubt that he could do it against good competition as well. What I would say is he's being picked 245 overall, wide receiver 63, so completely off the board. If Davis has to miss a lot of time, Taewon Taylor is gonna take over that slot role while Decker mains the outside in, in those sets. So he could have some really good value. For right now, they barely run four wide receivers. They almost never do. So his value is not good if Davis is back. However, with Decker's age, obviously, he's not going to be there for very long. So Taewon Taylor is probably the slot receiver of the future. Really good pick and keepers, really good pick and dynasty, good production in college, good measurables, uh, doing really well transitioning into the NFL. And in that slot role, you know, you could put up really good PPR numbers. So a lot of it depends on how it plays out in the injury category. But I, I, I dude, I love the tight ends, uh, the tight, the tight ends. I love tight ends too, but I love Titans offense this year. Behind all those guys, you have Tajay Sharp, who was last year's one-hit wonder in the offseason. Whatever, he flamed out. I don't even know if he's going to be in, on the roster. And you have Harry Douglas, who's just a depth play for them at wide receiver. No one you're taking in fantasy. And since I mentioned I love tight ends, let's get into Delaney Walker. I think Walker suffers the most from all these weapon acquisitions this offseason. Now, he led the Titans in target share in each of the last two seasons. He had 26% of the targets in 2015, 25% of the targets in 2016, which is which is good numbers for like a wide receiver one. That's like the target share you'd like to see. But we're definitely going to see that number drop a little bit because they're going to be running more tight end, like one tight end sets because Anthony Fasano's out. So it's 
He's in Miami, so it's very likely that they ask Walker to stay in and block a little more. I don't think he's going to have like a terrible year. I don't think it's a huge drop off, but I think his touchdown totals come down because Decker's going to eat up a lot of those over the middle targets and a lot of red zone targets. But Walker's been consistent, man. Top five fantasy option over the last two years. Top eight for three years straight, even though last year was a down year for tight ends. You know, but Walker will be 33 this month in August, going 96 overall as tight end nine. He's going right around where he should be, I think. Uh, he's, a, he's a high floor player, not a huge ceiling. I would say like medium to low ceiling. You're going to get consistency at the position, good amount of targets, but not a lot of upside. So there are other guys with more upside around that spot that I would probably prefer. And as always, I prefer Jack Doyle to a ton of the guys going before him. So now I move on to the running backs. And I don't think there's like a huge conversation to have here. I think it's the same thing that we'll see this year as we did last year with DeMarco Murray dominating touches in the backfield. And it's not, like, I, I don't know, there's no reason to switch up what they had last year. They have one of the best offensive lines. They chew up the clock. They're going to try to protect Mariota. So they're going to continue to run the ball, even though they might move towards a more pass-heavy offense. Don't think it hurts them at all. Maybe it helps DeMarco stay a little healthy. Like I said, little hamstring injury in camp. Uh, he's day-to-day, -day, so I'm not very concerned unless we see something else come out about him. And you can argue, you know, at this point in his career, Derrick Henry's a better back, but Tennessee clearly doesn't think so. Uh, DeMarco had 300, or just under 350 touches compared to around 125 for Henry. So almost a three to one ratio. And even if you think Derrick Henry gets more carries this year, right? DeMarco Murray absolutely dominates this backfield in the passing game. He saw 67 targets, which is top 10 in the NFL to Derrick Henry's 15. And he tied Rashard Matthews for the team lead in targets inside the 10 yard line with six. So he's not only a part of their passing game, but he's a part of their running game on the goal line and he's a part of their passing game on the goal line too. Something that's not gonna change. No, no matter how good and how big of a bruiser Derrick Henry is, Murray is still the guy on third downs. Look at carries inside the five yard line. Murray had 12, Derrick Henry only had four. And Murray ranked 50 in the NFL with 26 carries inside the opponent's 10 yard line. Just saying, I think Derrick Henry's gonna get a bigger workload, or DeMarco Murray's old, he's, in, he's gonna get injured, is not a valid argument for knocking Murray down the board. Good argument, I could say, because you know, you gotta play devil's advocate sometimes. Look over the last three games of, of the Titans uh, season last year. Henry scored three touchdowns, Murray didn't score a touchdown. But Murray still out-touched him 51-31 to 31 over that span. It was just a very small sample size. So, you know, you can say you hand over like 40 of Murray's carries to Henry this year. That's not a huge number, but it's probably realistic. 40, maybe 50. Murray's still seeing over 300 touches. He's leading a backfield that had the third most rushing attempts per game last year. Third highest rushing yards total. And just an elite offensive line that he's going to come into the year with. There's nothing I don't like about DeMarco this year. He finished last year as running back five in fantasy and ADP wise, he's going RB9, 17th overall. I think it's an absolute steal there. If I can get him early second round, if I'm in a 12 team league and I get the, the snake pick there, like 12 and 13, I would be fine taking DeMarco there. Uh, DeMarco there. And then on the other hand, Derrick Henry at pick 77, running back 27, I think is just insanity. You have guys like Frank Gore, Paul Perkins, LeGarrette Blunt, all starting running backs going after Derrick Henry. So let someone else, I remember when I first started looking into fantasy this year and Derrick Henry was going off the board like 60th overall, like running back 22. I was like, good God. If you want to handcuff Murray with Henry, it's not really a handcuff. In my opinion, you're going to have to spend a 7th or 8th round pick on Henry. So you're spending two of your top eight picks on one backfield. So Henry, while you know, while he does put up decent numbers, he, he doesn't really have standalone value. Like You would be comfortable starting Derrick Henry in your RB2 or RB3 spot? Probably not, because he could easily have like an 8-carry, 45-yard game. So unless he's getting goal line looks, which Murray got the very large majority of them last year, Henry's not that valuable to you, so. so that's why I wrap up. I love Murray. I, I love everything about this offense, so if, if they can improve on defense, then I think they are a legit playoff contender and a legit contender to make a deep run. We'll, we'll leave it at that. As always, scroll down and give it that thumbs up if you liked the video. Subscribe to the channel if you're new. We'll be coming at you for the rest of the summer as well into the season with some fancy football action, boy. And I want to leave y'all with a question like usual. Which of these three wide receivers are you drafting and why? 0.5 PPR, you know I'm all about Decker. I love Rashard Matthews. If Rashard Matthews and Corey Davis' ADP switched and Davis was going 45 picks after Matthews, sure, I'd say Corey Davis is, is the guy that I like there. But he's not, you're getting Rashard Matthews for almost nothing. I'll let you guys answer that question. Which of these three wide receivers do you like most? 0.5 PPR. And also, do you like Marcus Mariota or Jameis Winston straight up? That's it. 
Go follow me on Twitter. Go do everything you gotta do. I'll see y'all next time. Yeah.